afternoon session is a shellfish uh, management block. I'm sorry. Yes, they're shellfish management block. And the first speaker is Dr. Tora Johnson. And uh, Tora Johnson is a social scientist and associate professor at the University of Maine Trias. And she serves as the director of the GIS Laboratory. Her research focuses on helping coastal communities make important decisions about natural resources in the Downeast region. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, I'll try to not put you to sleep after lunch. Um, so I'm here to um, talk with you about um, some work that we've been doing. Um, we, uh, at the GIS Laboratory, we do a lot of work um, helping uh, communities in, in, in the coastal region in lots of different ways. And one of the things that we've been hearing from a number of sources, including um, from harvest, the shellfish harvesters and um, folks uh, doing, uh, folks on uh, shellfish committees and folks inside DMR, that there were problems with harvesters determining what areas were safe and legal to harvest. Um, and so we acquired funding from uh, the NASA Maine Space Grant Consortium, as well as the Maine Coastal Program, and that funding came through the Washington County Council of Governments that allowed us to explore this um, question um, and ideally move forward. So I'm here to report on the results, uh, the preliminary results of this work. Um, so the question for this research, the main questions were how well did DMR closure notices and maps um, serve harvesters in, in their efforts to determine where it's safe and legal to harvest? Um, also, how can they be improved? What do harvesters need in those closure notices and maps to more effectively and precisely determine when it's safe and legal to harvest? And what sort of access do harvesters have to technology? So what we did in this work was to um, begin with interviews with key stakeholders, so key people involved with shell fisheries who were familiar with um, with some of the issues around uh, maps and, and closure notices, um, talked with them about their concerns, and then we used that information to create a survey. Um, we also did a review of how other states do their closure notices and how they map the closures and how they communicate to harvesters. Um, so the survey um, uh, we conducted uh, uh, over the, uh, over the summer and fall, and many of you probably in the room responded to that survey. Thank you um, for your feedback. Um, the population that we, uh, that we sent the survey to included all licensed harvesters in the state, as well as all farmers and dealers in the state. Um, we also used um, a stakeholder list provided by Dr. Bridie McGreevy, um, and, uh, and we also sort of broadcast an invitation to take the survey to the whole DMR um, shellfish uh, list, stakeholder list. Um, and we did a combination of internet and mail surveys, and it was a uh, you know, pretty lengthy survey, 26 questions. So the, a, a few things to note about the, um, about the survey and what we got back. Um, so we sent out a combination of, um, of email surveys directly to 2,000 people. I don't know what the number is on the, the DMR list, um, so, and there's probably some overlap between uh, those folks. Um, but 2,000 got a direct email invitation, and then 500 folks on the, on the licensee list did not have email addresses listed, so we sent them paper um, paper uh, surveys. Um, one thing to notice is that we had a lot of bounces, so um, uh, so the number, typically when you have a list of people who have just in the past year given somebody their address and you send them an invitation, the number of, of bounce backs is very low, you know, one or two percent, and we had a, a relatively higher number um, than that. <clears throat> um, oh, and there was, uh, we did receive um, 294 complete responses and about 54 partial responses, um, and so valid responses in total was about 350. Um, we, 
we did find that there were lots of duplicate addresses. That's interesting um, for one particular reason that's, that's important here, um, which is that uh, many of the um, many of the uh, there were there were dozens and dozens in the in the um, licensee list where they were going to the same address and we learned from um, some of the folks there that there there are harvesters using the address of their buyer as their mailing address for their for their license um, so that makes it you know a little challenging to reach harvesters. We also have some evidence that there's some literacy issues, and we think that that was part of um, a relatively low response rate, not a bad response rate from, from you know, social science perspective. Um, but um, we did have a, 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 a three harvesters call us and say, I don't write, I don't really read, so, but I want to answer your survey and I want you to hear what I have to say and we interviewed them instead and recorded their responses. We also had a couple of people respond to the survey saying, I don't read or write, but my friend is filling this out for me. So there's an, there's, um, um, an understanding that, that literacy might have stood in the way of, of, of probably more harvesters than we even heard from there. Um, it was interesting to note that many of the harvesters that those harvesters went that extra mile to make sure that we heard um, their voices, and that was pretty important. So, um, uh, just so you see who, what the roles are, um, we uh, we heard from 182 professional harvesters, and um, you can see the uh, the uh, distribution. The number here adds up to more than the 350, um, just because. Many people had dual role, roles. You know, some people were both a harvester and um, were on the on their local shellfish committee or, or something like that. Um, and here's the age distribution. Um, as you can see, an older lot. Um, and income distribution was all over the map. Incidentally, if you want to study this data um, more closely, we do. I do have a link to this um, presentation that I'll, I'll show at the end as well. And this is a really important result, uh, the year's harvesting. So we did have about a, a little over a quarter of our respondents um, had been uh, harvesting or farming, and now we're looking only at harvesters and farmers. They'd only been doing this for, for five or fewer years. But the majority have been um, doing it for over 10 years. So, so when we get into the results here, remember that over half of our sample was very experienced. Um, so now from going forward from here, we're just going to look at professional harvesters, professional farmers, um, shellfish committee members, and subsistence or recreational uh, harvesters. <coughs> so the data going forward is just those folks. So just the people who actually literally have to take clams out of the mud and sell them for food, right? So we asked them how they determine, and this was something that DMR really um, was interested to know, is which of the various ways um, that DMR uses to try and um, help harvesters know what's open and closed, which of the various ways were they using? We were actually kind of surprised to find that about two-thirds of the sample um, of, uh, of the professional harvesters uh, used the hotline. And that was also surprising considering the complaints that they also, the feedback that they gave us on the hotline on the, on the survey. Um, and the map descriptions were um, were very important too. Notice though that email notices for professional harvesters were way down on the list, right? So um, in terms of what they use every time or most times, um, that was important. The other thing that was also crucial is how many use <coughs> fellow harvesters most or all of the time. And that was something we knew to put there because we had heard anecdotally, both through interviews as well as, um, you know, uh, just 
folk feedback that we'd gotten that we'd heard that there was a subset of harvesters that were relying specifically on other harvesters to provide them with closure, closure information. Then we asked these folks if in the past year how often they had trouble determining which areas were safe and legal to harvest shellfish and as you can see um, even professional harvesters and remember over half of this sample was very experienced um, they uh, over half of them said that they had had trouble um, notably of the recreational and subsistence, har subsistence harvesters almost two-thirds reported having that kind of trouble. Um, uh, Cole has informed me that the only folks who have reported um, health effects from biotoxins, is that true, are um, recreational harvesters. So there may be a correlation there, and, um, and so that presents some significant concern. Um, also, we, we used local shellfish committee members as a sort of proxy for, you know, selecting folks who should be the most informed and the most able to determine what was closed and what was open, and they had just as much trouble as, um, as the professional harvesters as a, as a group. Um, and so this suggested that um, likely there was some difficulty in getting information to harvesters. Uh, and, and so some of the, uh, these are some of the typical um, comments that we received when we asked folks to, to comment on the, on the trouble that they've had. Um, and I'll let you, I'm not going to read these to you, but um, they ran the gamut from written, you know, talking about the written descriptions I'll give you a second to glance through these. And by and large, the complaints about the written descriptions were that they were really difficult to decipher, really hard to understand. And then the maps that accompany the written descriptions um, were uh, as, as we saw, they're used more often in, in trying to determine which areas were closed, um, but um, we have received a large, large number of complaints. The vast majority of the, of the concerns that folks expressed um, related to the maps. And we'll take a look at some of these, um, of these <coughs> concerns. So the issues had to do with the content of the map, so the stuff that was in the map, um, the scale of the map, and, um, and the amount of detail in the map, as we'll see. So let's take a look at an example. So this is uh, my backyard in Chayas Bay. And this is just a... a um, you know, a, a randomly selected map. Um, notice that uh, there's, there are no town boundaries, there's no roads. It's difficult to even um, determine exactly which points of land and, and um, reference points are referred to. And this was, um, uh, you know, we understand that the, the maps evolved as, you know, a legacy from a time when um, making maps was much harder than it is now, that we've sort of been doing things the same old way for, for some time. Um, another issue that um, may come into play, oh, right, one more thing I want to say about this, which is that the scale of the map um, is, <coughs> right, so these maps come in a PDF format. It's, a, it's, it's set to be, if you were to print it out, it would come on an eight and a half by 11, piece of paper for all of the Chaya today like this, there's no zooming in, there's no way to recombine it with other information, right, that sort of fix the way it is. Um, and, and so scale, um, scale was an issue that came out of many of the comments, right? I can't, I can't tell at this scale, essentially, <coughs> as Mr. said, what is going on, where that line is. 
Another issue, so 4.5% of our sample, which is a slightly less than um, the, uh, the general population, but 4.5% of our sample said that they are colorblind. And so any red or green um, symbols on the map would turn to essentially gray. Um, and um, so here's how it would be seen um, with color blindness. Um, this is probably less of an issue um, for, the, for these maps, but um, uh, folks have been testing web-based maps where red, there's lots of red overlaying green, um, especially on an aerial background, and that would make it difficult to, to interpret. Um, moving on to the hotline, um, a couple of things, common um, complaints of the hotline, the, the message is too long, many, many people said it was hard to hear, that you have to wait and, and listen to it again in order to hear it, and make sure it's silent in the room, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, also another thing that folks, we didn't even ask about this actually, but um, we should have. Uh, but it did come up in a lot of the comments, which was, it's hard to find. You need two maps, right? You need the biotoxin closures and the pollution closures, and they're two separate parts of the website. So that gave us a sense that, you know, maybe simplifying the path to, um, to the uh, maps on the website and maybe finding ways to combine the maps might make sense in the future. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, so we asked, folks, okay, if you could have any map, you know, whatever it would be, what would it look like? And we asked them about things like format and content and so forth. So when we asked about, um, about uh, their preferred format, um, those PDFs are still pretty popular, uh, but, but an interactive map, whether it's for a computer or for a smartphone, was also useful. You know, there certainly were a number of, of folks who responded who didn't think any of those things were useful at all. Um, <laughs> some of them just said, no, no, no. Um, so, so, and it's important to remember that that small number of folks still need to figure out where it's safe and legal to harvest. Um, but, uh, but we did get the message that a large number of folks are, uh, would, would appreciate an interactive map. Um, and here's what the distribution looked like um, uh, for divided up by in those groups. And I show this primarily so that you can see that those recreational harvesters really like a, a downloadable interactive map or something for a smartphone. Um, so there is some variation. And that the professional harvesters were a little more interested in um, a, a web-based um, map for a computer. Um, there's a lot of information on this, um, but, but essentially this is the features that folks would find most useful in their order of usefulness. Um, so current biotoxin and bacterial closures were the most considered the most useful. Um, and then of course the extra detail that many of the folks in their, um, in their comments had asked for. Um, we were sort of surprised that a nautical chart boundary might be helpful, um, but I know finding those red buoys, which are often referenced in the, um, uh, there would be um, helpful. Um, and so I'll let you glance through this. Now, we also wanted to know, okay, if we're going to make web-based maps or maps to be looked for you to look at on your phone, what would you want? You know, what what do you use? And this was a really important, um, a really important uh, part of the survey. Um, so one thing that was interesting is the vast majority of the folks who responded are using a smartphone, and a surprising number of them. Um, uh, use only a smartphone to access the internet. So their only way they access the internet is a smartphone. So that's, a, that's an important um, uh, consideration. 
There's also a number who um, didn't use any technology at all, which I'll get to in a second. And here's the same information in a little bit of a different format. And here you can see that 72% of, of these folks um, are using um, a smartphone at least once a day. And only, um, yeah. And it's less than half that use a, a computer once a day, actually, in total. So, some important takeaways from our, uh, from looking at technology. It's not, you know, okay, making a map that is zoomable and works for smartphones is going to fix everything. Right? Because most people use smartphones, but about 20% don't ever use a smartphone. Um, about half use a computer daily, it's slightly less than half, but the other half don't. Right? And 10% access the internet only with a smartphone, and about a little, a little over 6% never use any technology. I suspect, and I didn't anticipate this, I, I suspect that that 6% it has a lot of overlap with the folks who are using other harvesters to determine what's enclosed. Um, <coughs> and, um, and this was a typical comment, I don't use technology, I talk to people, I'm only doing this because my friend is asking me the question. And we had, we had a few um, comments like that on the survey that indicated um, you know, no technology. And, and, you know, some of the folks who called us and asked us to interview um, said, I don't want to touch the computer. I'm not interested in the computer. Um, so the lesson that, that we <coughs> sort of take away from this is um, there are a few um, crucial issues. So first of all, um, we, I think there's a general consensus that that's too much uncertainty. That we need to be much more certain when public health is concerned with regard to um, closures. We also have heard, um, we heard some of this in the interview research, um, both directly from harvesters, but we also heard sort of secondhand that um, there are, for instance, areas uh, situations where harvesters are just unsure where the line is and if they're being careful they're harvesting very short of that line leaving areas that could be harvested unharvested because they're unsure where to, where to stop. We heard um, several anecdotes where harvesters said um, one person said I went down to the flat and nobody was there so I figured it was closed. Right, And, and that was sort of one way that they um, determined and you know we didn't hear but presumably there are some folks who go down there they don't see anybody they're like I guess they're all home and and harvest I don't there's no way to know right there's there's uncertainty um, we also heard about people who harvested and later found that the flats were closed and had you know had to adapt from there and lost um, lost the time and the and the, um, the harvest itself so that would suggest that we need to do better um, and that uh, improving the tools that the harvesters have, especially, especially diminishing the amount of uncertainty that we have for the professional harvesters and addressing the, the large amount of uncertainty that we have for recreational and subsistence harvesters um, is really crucial. Um, and then also we need to be ready to serve multiple audiences. So it wasn't, you know, I sort of had this fantasy when we started doing this that it'd be like, oh, they all have smartphones, it'll be great. We'll just do a smartphone thing and it'll all fix it, right? No, there's, we need to come up with a plan to reach a, a diverse audience, right? We need to reach the folks who access the internet only on their smartphones and we know we can get them there. Right and and have maps that they can use that, that give them meaningful information on a little tiny screen. Um, but
but we also need to work out ways to um, to reach folks who are um, who are uh, identifying where what areas are closed right now through simply word of mouth. Right? Um, and so. Uh, Web-based maps, which is something DMR has been testing, and then in our lab, we've been mocking up possible um, web-based solutions for this, um, seem like a really good possibility. And they're going to need to be adaptable. It's not something we'll, we'll probably easily be able to do tomorrow. Um, but they'll, they'll need to be adaptable to multiple audiences. And then we'll also need some kind of communication plan to reach those folks who will never see those maps. So what do we do now? What do we do with this information? So following um, uh, this work and, and compiling this information, um, we'll, I'll be putting together a report which I'll provide to, um, to Cole and her staff uh, at the um, Bureau of Public Health. And um, we're looking for funding now to move forward to provide DMR with the resources to put together um, the tools that we need to, to um, communication. One of the crucial elements going forward is going to be input and help from harvesters. And so please, um, I'm hoping today I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to leave a little time for us to chat today and, and answer questions and, and um, collect some input. Um, but also we'll be asking the, the um, harvesters all across the state to test things out. So hey, try this map out and tell us what, you know, see if you can break it. Um, does this, you know, give you the information you need, etc. And also for coming up for ideas, how do we best reach, you know, the older harvester who has no access to technology? How do we best reach um, harvesters who can't read? Um, that's going to be a really crucial piece. And, um, and then uh, I think probably even a tougher nut to crack is going to be how do we describe the closures in words that make them a little, a little more accessible. Um, so if you'd like to explore the data from this survey a little more closely um, and uh, uh, you know, explore this, um, this information, you can access the slideshow here. Uh, and if you have your cell phone with you and you have a QR code reader, if you're one of those cell phone people, you can scan this, um, this QR code and, and it'll take you right to this, or to this um, uh, slideshow. Okay. And so I think I, think I left plenty of time for questions. Yeah, great. Yes? Um, I just have one question. I, I, I find I, I can use the thing on I go online also to the, the uh, phone um, before I go before I go harvesting I call the hotline and yes. I have gone web on the website and saw the maps and they, I thought they're adequate but um, they opened up a cove and, and um, this was on Deer Isle and they opened up the cove and I thought well I've never been there so I'll go out there but I've also I've noticed that when they open up these coves they don't go out and take down the sign that says it's closed. That's a physical thing that, you know, if you're going to open the close, you open a cove, you should actually take down the sign. I know you have to put it back up if it closes again, but still, <laughs> it does seem like it's something that makes confusion if you don't take the sign down. Yeah. Actually, so in the survey, um, signage was one of the things I didn't include in the survey, but we had several comments where people said there was a sign. There was a map on a telephone pole. I didn't know what to believe. There were people harvesting, but I didn't recognize them. All sorts of, yeah. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm not one of the managers, but I think one of the issues is that, um, you know, different towns have different protocols for putting signage up. And, and that is probably gonna have to be part of it. And that's really important feedback for us going forward is making sure that's part of our communication plan going forward is when we're posting information, A, how, does, how do we structure that information so it's really usable, and B, how do we make sure it's current? And, and people did mention that signs weren't current. Right? I don't know if this sign meant you know, the, the flat was really in this 
you know, open or close, whatever the sign said. So that's a good point. Yes, back there. Um, the towns don't put up the, the closure signs, the marine patrol laws, the ah. closure signs. Um, some of the, so some of the, com and I, you know, I don't know, some of the comments said, you know, somebody from the Shellfish Commission was putting up the sign. Yeah, so and I, so I think there's a combination of different signage things going on. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? So I would like to ask the harvesters in the room, um, is this, are, is the, are the results ringing true not only about your own experience, but of experience that you have of other harvesters that you, um, that are in your community? Um, does this ring true? The results? Are you seeing a variety of different? Are you seeing, first of all, some trouble figuring out what's open and closed and where the line is? We only have four licensed houses in town. Ah. Most of them know when things close and on. We do have one that probably does not have any access to any online or anything. Yep. And you all sort of take take care of that person. Make sure they know. For the most part, we need to do where the model someone stops and tells them that. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Great. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I'm a dealer down east in Costco, and uh, a lot of what you've said, you know, rings true about illiteracy, or Jim Bob told me it was okay to go down there. Uh, yeah. And I also, I've been to court. For only one marine violation, but the day I sat there in the court, I realized, listening to the full docket of everyone's uh, infractions or whatnot, that it seemed like a lot of people were there and you know were served as summons and whatnot, and they really, I don't think they knew that they were in the wrong area, yep. <clears throat> as well as guys losing days work because they heard from so and so's girlfriend that it's a you know it's a red tie. It's a rain tide. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of harvesters don't know. You know, I've heard them say to me, it didn't rain that much. It can't be a red tide right now. And so what's the difference between the two? You know, and so there's, I don't see that, you know, you know, the maps are nice, the hotline stinks. Because you sit there, if you're in East Fort Maine, you're gonna start at Kittery. I mean, all you'd have to do is push one if you're mid coast, push three if you're down east and and you know, and so on. So there's lots of stuff like that that I think could really enable this industry and get us to move ahead. And instead of frustrating potential harvesters, you know, encouraging them and take, you know, breaking down those those barriers. Just the clam tag itself, it's a piece of tie back that no one in their right mind could ever write their name and license number on and anything like that. I mean it's just really tough unless you have a brand new Sharpie. So, you know, <laughs> Yeah, and it's not yeah. wet, huh? That's that's a tough one right there. So we got to a point where we printed uh, on like a zebra printer everyone's own tags with their name on it, with their license on it, and also the codes. And we made, we came up with an abbreviation for every code. Code like Birch Point was BP, and Layton Point was LP. That way, the digger, if he wasn't able to write, he could just circle. You know, circle the town, circle the number of pounds, all those sorts of things. Because I found that a lot of harvesters would have their friend or their girlfriend or their wife fill out their tags for them in advance. And if they went down to such and such a cove and it was too windy, they decided to jump to another cove, they got a false tag. And they're bringing their product in. So there's lots of things like that. But I think in your research, I wouldn't worry about the harvesters that don't have smartphone or internet access. I think if you're going to build it, keep it simple. And those harvesters can still rely on the other person on the flat who does have, you know, um, and it just seems like you ought to be able to, just like when you're going to go somewhere and you enter your zip code to find your closest Walmart, you ought to be able to just tap on a map and it will say, you dummy, this is closed, get out of there fast. <laughs> Don't drop your gear, you know. Right. Um, but it seems like we ought to be able in this day and age to really break down those Barriers, but it's good work. It's, it's very desperately needed. Thank you. Yeah, and the technology now it does exist where we've done a mock up of, a, of an app that allows you literally to tap a little thing that will show me where I am. And 
there are the, the, you know, the polygons that show this is closed for this reason, this is closed for that reason, this is open. And so, so what we need now is the resources to produce it and test it. Yes. Well, my question is how much? I mean, how big a nut is this to try to? Well, we are in the process of submitting a grant that I think would get us there for um, thirty, forty thousand. So it's it's not a huge nut. It's it's very doable. Yep. Anybody else? Killed you killed it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much.